The second question that we'd like to discuss is one that I think bears directly on the two aspects that we just discussed regarding Psalm 8, verse 3. The question, how do you analyze God's word, maybe in contrast with children's honesty and purity, in seeking instruction addressing spiritual challenges today? Now, what follows is a particular example, and I, of course, would like to return to the particular example, but first, the general principle. You'll note that there's an emphasis here, as there must be, on analyzing. The underlying premise in the question is we encounter all sorts of spiritual challenges in the world in which we live. How are we going to confront those challenges? What are we supposed to do? Ultimately, our answer necessarily is we seek the guidance in God's word. And perhaps the most apt way of expressing that is with the words that we read in Deuteronomy at the end of chapter 29. In some of your editions of the Bible, chapter 29 begins at a different verse than in mine. So I'm emphasizing that it's the last verse of the chapter. In my Bible, it's chapter 29, verse 28. The secret things belong to God our Lord. But those things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever. That we may do all the words of this Torah. All the words of this teaching. Now, that establishes a critically important baseline. Namely, from our perspective, whatever choices we make, whatever we do, we strive to have them informed by what we sincerely assess to be right. And when I say sincerely assess to be right, I'm going to emphasize here, this is not, this cannot be a merely emotional decision. Because, you know, emotions inevitably can pull us in any direction at all. With respect to emotions, every individual may feel differently. Any given individual feels differently at different parts of his life, sometimes different hours of the day. And inevitably, we're forced to appreciate that through emotions, you can end up justifying even the most terrible crimes. We don't determine what is right by what our emotions tell us. The only role that we can give to emotions with respect to the question of right and wrong is after we have calmly, analytically determined what is right, we should definitely involve our emotions in feeling passionate about what's right. But we don't decide right and wrong through our passions. We decide what's right and wrong and then inflame our passions to go ahead and do what we determine to be right. Where do we seek guidance for what is right? As we just saw in Deuteronomy chapter 29, we seek guidance in the words of God. You know, from our perspective, whenever we pray, we're connecting with God. In prayer, we talk to God. And whenever we study God's word, we also connect with God. When we study God's word, God talks back to us. And in this ongoing dialogue that fills our lives, we talk to God in prayer, and God talks to us through his revelation, through his word. 
Can you talk to can, can I ask a question? Um okay. Uh, okay. Yes? Yes. Please? Okay. Okay. Uh can Doc talk to you by nature as a bird for anything? Of course, God can talk to us through any number of means and I'll just stress, obviously, God gave us two major compositions. One, his revealed word. The other, the world. God, after all, is the giver of his word in the Bible, and God is the creator of nature. But still and all, we recognize that nature by itself is much too ambiguous to be able to give us clear instruction. That is, as we noted earlier, there are those who will look to nature, as expressed in Isaiah chapter 40, lift up your eyes and see who created these, and you connect with God. But there are also those who look to nature and find in nature nothing more than a vindication of their own arrogance and intellectual prowess. We focus in particular, therefore, on God's revelation. And I feel compelled to stress here an additional dimension that in our tradition is axiomatic in our considering the content of that revelation. This is a very important point that those who aren't well versed in the traditions of the Jews in studying the Bible may find surprising, but it's absolutely foundational from our perspective. And that is, we regard all the books of our Bible, the Hebrew Bible, comprising the five books of Moses, the prophets, and the holy writings. Every one of them as the result of divine inspiration. Everything that we find in each of these books, then, is inspired by the Holy Spirit that comes from God. But the Torah, and by Torah I mean here, what is meant by the word Torah in the verse from Deuteronomy that we read, chapter 29, verse 28, the five books of Moses, isn't merely inspired by the Holy Spirit that comes from God. The Torah is actual dictation. It is the word of God, period, exactly, verbatim. Moses takes dictation from God. The difference between the words of the Torah and the words of the prophets and the holy writing is first, I should stress, something that has its basis in what we read at the very end of the Torah. What we read in Deuteronomy, Chapter 34, verse 10. And there arose not a prophet since in Israel like Moses, whom God knew face to face. Never again would there be a conduit so pure, so precise in conveying God's word to the world. And indeed, Considering in that light, that was the third from last verse of the five books of Moses, the third from last verse of the prophets, the end of the prophecy of the last of the prophets in the Hebrew Bible, Malachi, in chapter 3, verse 22. The prophet bids us remember the Torah of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Choreb, in Sinai, for all Israel, both statutes and judgments. Remember the Torah, and it's the Torah of Moses. 
I'm stressing this point because as we consider the various spiritual challenges that confront us, on the one hand, we regard every word of the Bible as there to provide us with guidance. Indeed, we have a tradition that there were innumerably more prophets in our history than those whose words are recorded in the Bible. The ones whose words were recorded in the Bible gave us prophecies that continue to be needed by all generations. So we certainly regard all of the Bible as there to teach us. But instruction, an actual user's manual to life, a legal guide that we seek specifically in the five books of Moses. And inevitably, when we seek it, we use that capacity to analyze. What I mean by that is, we have a problem. This problem is one that we have discussed in the past. In particular, I'll remind you that almost two years ago, we had a session on Exodus chapter 21, it's there in the archive, on understanding an eye for an eye. And we spoke there of the interplay between the written text, the five books of Moses, what we call the written Torah, and the oral commentary associated with it, the oral Torah, which we believe comes no less from God, from Sinai, than the written word. And the reason for the necessity of these two media, because the written word is absolute. It is static. It is immutable. It is the absolute unchanging truths of God revealed to the world. But we don't live in an absolute unchanging world. We live in a world in perpetual flux. We live in a world that's always moving. And therefore, we live in a world in which we'll always need to go back to the written word and through the guidance of that oral tradition to understand what it's telling us and how to live our lives in its light. And before we move on, as I'd like to presently, to the implications of all of this, with respect to the example in question two, I'm going to stress an additional dimension that flows, I think, necessarily from what I just said. The Torah, again, comes from God. The written text, the immutable divine truths revealed in the world. But our world is changing. And that presents us with an intricate challenge, because on the one hand, if we don't keep pace with the changing world, we become irrelevant. We become obsolete. We become archaic. We become fossilized. On the other hand, if our focus becomes only on keeping up with the world, on adapting ourselves to however the world is changing, then someplace way back in the background, we'll leave God's word behind. That must not happen. We always need to consider in this tension between the unchanging word and the changing world, how to relate God's word to his world. And that challenge remains. And to be very candid with you, we do indeed have a tendency as a result to be, we'll be honest here, old fashioned. Not too old fashioned, but old fashioned in the sense that when you believe you're bearing God's word given to the world, 
You're not going to make changes in it. And you're not going to take any kind of a cavalier attitude with respect to changing the way you understand God's words. That's something that needs to be done with utmost caution and utmost sensitivity. And with that, as an introduction, let's continue with the example of question two. For example, does the Bible give guidance regarding the role of women in marriage, religion, and modern society generally? Is there a biblical answer to whether women can seek to render the clergy or become congregational leaders? Women's issues have, of course, become central in contemporary society. And on manifold planes, I think we all regard that as a great blessing. That is, the opportunities that are available to women today are incomparably greater than the opportunities that were available to women even just a few decades ago, let alone in the more distant past, especially when nearly everyone earned his livelihood through manual labor. And of course, in a world in which people bring home the food by manual labor, men tend to have an advantage over women because they're bigger and more muscular. Well, we live in a world in which that's not necessarily the case, and much of the world still is the case. But in more and more of the world, women can truly aspire to equal opportunities, and that's a blessed thing. And considering that blessing, maybe the first focus of our attention should be what we read in Genesis regarding the caring together of man and woman. First, the creation of man. We read in chapter 1, verse 27. So God created mankind with his own essence. In the essence of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. The creation of mankind essentially is male and female. Granted, in Genesis chapter 2, we read something of a particularization of that, but from the outset, there's an emphasis that male and female necessarily go together, hand in hand. And perhaps even more emphatically, at the beginning of Genesis chapter 5, we read, this is the book of the generations of man. In the day that God created mankind, in the likeness of God, he made him. Male and female, he created them and blessed them and called their name man in the day when they were created. So, of course, once again, there's the emphasis that Male and female, he created them. That man and woman go together, hand in hand. As expressed, of course, in Genesis chapter 2, helpmate. And even more so, in the words we just read in Genesis chapter 5, verse 2, he called their name man in the day when they were created. Which more than implies, it really states that unless you have this partnership of man and woman, you don't really have a complete human being. A complete human being is man and woman taken together. So, of course, in that vein, the central importance of the unit of man and woman, the partnership of man and woman, is essential and is inviolable. And you know, likewise, we can't help but emphasize the extent to which we see that as a template in the history of man as recorded in the Bible. Consider as a case in point the central roles played 
in the lives of our holy fathers and mothers, specifically by the mothers. That is, on the one hand, the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, certainly strike us as the more public roles. But the mothers, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah, if you think about it, each one at a critical juncture in the history of Israel played a role that the men didn't understand, that the men didn't discern. And it's precisely because of the sensitivity, the insight, the understanding of the women that at that critical crossroads, we merged. In the case of Sarah, the example, of course, is a very obvious one. In Genesis chapter 21, when Sarah discerns the negative influence that Ishmael is liable to have on Isaac, Sarah says to Abraham, cast out this bondwoman, Hagar, and her son. And the Bible records the thing was very grievous in Abraham's eyes because of his son until God said to Abraham, let not it be grievous in your sight because of the lad and because of your bondwoman. In all that Sarah had said to you, hearken to her voice. She's got it right. Listen to your wife. The female contribution, our Holy Mother. And of course, in the case of Isaac, the example is no less striking. That is, in Genesis chapter 27, when we read about the apportioning of the blessing to the son, the chosen son of Isaac, exactly what Isaac wanted to bestow upon the son receiving the blessing is something that I think we've noted in other contexts and maybe we'll yet discuss in the future in our studies of Genesis. But in any case, Isaac had his mind set on Esau. It's Rebecca who contrived to ensure that Jacob would be the one to receive the blessing. And once again, we believe her insight was the correct one. She saw what Isaac failed to see. And likewise, in the following generation, when Jacob is vacillating over whether he should be going back home from the household of Laban, of Lavan, or remaining, it is specifically in chapter 31 of Genesis, in verses 14, 15, and 16, that Rachel and Leah are the ones to tell Jacob, get up and go. Everything that God tells you, you are to do. Jacob needed that push specifically by the Holy Mothers. Again, Rachel and Leah at the crossroad, ensuring that Israel emerges as God had indeed designated. So we see it in the lives of our Holy Fathers and Holy Mothers, the partnership, and if anything, the central, dramatic role played specifically by the mothers. We see it as we've had occasion to note in our Bible studies, in Exodus chapter 1, it is especially striking that at the beginning of Exodus, we read stories of heroism. And all the heroes are heroines. We read of the midwives who stand up against Pharaoh's decree. We read of Yocheved and Miriam, 
the mother and sister of Moses, who play such critical roles in ensuring that Moses comes into the world, as we discussed at greater length in the session on Exodus chapter 1. And of course, we read about another heroine, the daughter of Pharaoh, who is the one to find and rescue Moses and thwart her own father's decree. Stories of heroism. But we should note, and this is critical, these stories of heroism are not about making big public splashes. Nor, for that matter, are the critical roles played by our holy mothers, roles that were played in some dramatic public arena. And it is in that vein that while we certainly bear in mind the essential importance of the partnership that we've been discussing, is an additional dimension, and that additional dimension is maybe most aptly expressed in Psalms, in Psalms chapter 45, verse 14, where we read, without any specific designation of who the object of the verse is, that the king's daughter is all glorious within. In our tradition, this is a description, the king's daughter, of women generally, because all women are daughters of the king, the true king. But in seeking the expression of that royalty, we don't necessarily look outside. We look within. And it's at this juncture that I feel especially driven to share with you an observation that is rooted in recent American history, but I think provides us with an important contrast in appreciating just what the Bible is telling us here. I'm referring with respect to recent American history of the criminal racist policies that were so prevalent in parts of the United States through the mid 20th century. And in all too many instances, the defense given for such criminal racism was, oh, we provide services for both whites and blacks, but those services are separate, separate but equal. So separate but equal meant that blacks had to sit in a special part of the movie theater and in a special part of the back of the bus and a special part of the trains and so on and so forth. In a landmark decision, of the Supreme Court of the United States, the court ruled separate but equal is not equal. And these racist policies were transformed overnight from legal criminal behavior to outlawed criminal behavior. Well, unquestionably, when you distinguish between people because of something no more significant, no less superficial than the color of their skin, then drawing such distinctions is simply a thinly veiled veneer for racism, and separate is never equal. But if you recognize that people, men and women, are different. If you read the message of the Bible and you see there's a partnership between men and women, but men and women 
are not the same. Men and women remain equal, but they're still separate. Then it's not a matter of chauvinism, prejudice, bigotry. It's a matter of recognizing that God established a world of men and women in order for each to complement the other and together to advance the world toward its final destiny. Now, of course, that doesn't necessarily mean that women can't do things or men can't do things. And, of course, there are overlaps within the roles. And inevitably, we recognize that there are many things that men and women need to do together, but not necessarily everything. And it is in this vein that I feel compelled to share with you a lesson that in our tradition we learn from the words of the Torah. I'm going to stress at the outset that because of the limitations of time, I'm not going into all the various levels of depth that appropriately apply to this subject. But I think a general appreciation is adequate for our purposes. We are, after all, not coming here to engage in any kind of formal legislation, but nevertheless. In Deuteronomy chapter 17, we read of the instruction in the Torah for the appointment of a king. In chapter 17, verse 15, you shall appoint a king over you. Now the text speaks rather tersely as the written text of the Torah always does. You shall appoint a king over you, whom God your Lord shall choose. In our oral tradition, the word king is highlighted. It's a king and not a queen. Nothing against queens generally, but we recognize that in life there are, after all, public and private spheres. From our perspective, in Judaism, there are also public and private spheres. What, we might wonder, is the center of Judaism? We might say the synagogue, the house of prayer. And undoubtedly, the synagogue is one of the centers of Judaism. But I have to say that it's not the center of Judaism. Because if the Torah is providing us with an all-encompassing way of life, then the all-encompassing way of life is something that's practiced not in the synagogue. You go to the synagogue to pray. You may go to the synagogue to study, but you live in your home. In your home. The king's daughter has her glory within. And it is in the home that the woman reigns supreme. As one brief example, you know, in a family, both the father and the mother are involved in ushering the most holy day of the year, the Sabbath, into the home. But who ushers the Sabbath in first? It's the mother, the woman. Kindling the lights, blessing the candles. That's the first step of ushering the holiness of Sabbath into the home. And on so many levels, the holiness of the home is primarily, indeed, the domain of the woman. So when we consider, then, the apportionment of different roles, we recognize, again, there's a lot of overlap. We recognize also, and it's important for us to stress this point, that messages that we discern in the Bible need to be applied to our changing world, as we noted earlier. And it's in this vein, then, that when we consider the challenges expressed in the question here, um, is there a biblical answer to whether women can teach or enter the clergy or become congregational leaders? My response is, undoubtedly, there's a biblical answer. 
What is the biblical answer? For that, we need to consider many things. Broadly, if the role is one that resembles that of a teacher, then we recognize from time immemorial that both men and women are teachers. If, on the other hand, the role is a leadership role more similar to that of a king, then we recognize that the glory of the king's daughter is inward. And maybe that's not the sort of role that we should be ascribing to the woman. Which is it in any given set of circumstances? Well, I already said, since this is not a session for the termination of biblical law, we don't have to answer that question. My purpose here is to use this example to illustrate a point. And the point that we need to illustrate, we grant, we're not going to be able to continue on to question three now, so we'll leave that in advance. The point to appreciate is, on the one hand, we still need to have the childish honesty and purity in our selfless dedication to listening, listening carefully, listening attentively to God's messages. God leads the way, and he continues to lead the way in everything that we do, in all that we decide, right and wrong, we learn from God. But honesty and purity will not be enough here. Because we're also going to need to analyze, and analyzing takes wisdom. So, does the Bible give guidance regarding the role of women? The Bible gives guidance regarding everything. How to live our lives. The Bible is the user's manual. And in particular, I'll reiterate, the Torah especially shows us the way. From the words of the prophets and the holy writings, we also learn. And to that extent, one can't help but consider the examples set by the prophetess Devorah, by Ruth and Naomi, by Hannah, the mother of the prophet Samuel, by the prophetess Hulda, by Queen Esther, all of them also serve as templates, and simultaneously, focusing especially on the words of the Torah, we strive to distill a message, to understand what there is for us to learn. An inexhaustible reservoir finding the appropriate balance in this particular case between teaching and leading, between being partners and having separate roles, between being equal and being different, and even between the aspects of the Bible's narrative that may not be prescriptive in telling us how to live, but simply descriptive in telling us how things were done in the old days. And maybe not everything that was done in the old days needs to be done today. Between that and those statements that are prescriptive in telling us how we continue to strive to live our lives as illuminated by God's Word. Simple answers? No. <laughs> and we conclude without giving any simple answers because, you know, in some way, reducing questions such as these to simple black and white answers would be committing the gravest travesty against God's Word because it would be implying that things are simple and can be so readily reduced to a simple bottom line. And they're not. But that doesn't in any way exempt us from striving to our utmost. From striving, apropos of the mouths of babes and sucklings, to integrate the honesty and purity and sincerity in our reading God's Word and striving to 
find guidance in that word for our lives together with the analytical prowess, the wisdom that we need to bring to bear precisely in order to accomplish that goal. An ongoing process, unquestionably, a lifelong task. But that's exactly what it should be. Because for all of our lives, we are continuously engaged in that dialogue with God. From the earliest moments of childhood, we talk to God, and God talks back to us. We just need to sensitize ourselves. Through, again, both the honesty, purity, and sincerity, and the analytical skills and wisdom, sensitize ourselves to hearing and understanding what God is saying. May we continue to grow through that dialogue and through that message. God bless you.